Hello everyone, welcome to a new Marvel Snap Zone group coaching. I have the paper point out, so we're gonna talk about like serious stuff. Uh, this week is uh, off, balance change wise, like we've had a pretty impactful new card, but otherwise no OTAs, no uh, balance patch, so we're gonna talk about more of an evergreen topic, and we are going to go a little bit more in depth into uh, deck building concepts and especially limitations to how like to what you can and cannot do when you build a deck and kind of like the the, the hidden rules you have to respect so your deck makes sense so the, the the goal today is at the end of the day you should be able to make a deck that at least makes sense will it be good that's up to a lot of things outside of our control, but it should at least make sense, which is the first step to building a deck that then can compete in a meta game. So there's only one person in the group today because uh, I guess others will show up or the, the time wasn't convenient for them. So I might talk a lot, but uh, we'll see. It might, it might become very, uh, very informal and might end up as a discussion. We'll see how it goes. So before we enter this tier report, this is a slide from a previous coaching session. I think the first one, if I remember correctly, is it something that's still okay? Like the concept of core cards, flex cards, tech cards, and what they mean towards like your deck. It is for me, yeah. Okay, so I won't, uh, I won't come back to it. If some people watching the video don't know uh, about this concept, feel free to ask for it, either in the comments or uh, find me on the, on the Discord directly. All right, so we're going to go to level two. Actually, can put it full screen. I don't know if it works. Does it work full screen? Oh, it's, I mean, it shows the next one anyway, so. Uh, ah, I had it planned and everything. Maybe I can, but I don't want to see this. Can I not see this? Can't. Oh, it's because it's on the wrong monitor. Okay. Uh, how do we do this? Damn it. Well, can I just move it around? No, I can't move it around. What happens if I just do this and start it? Does it go? Nope. Aww. Well, all my effects that I prepared are gone. Too bad. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's alright. So, uh, basically, uh, we're gonna work with three limitations. We got the obvious ones, which are basically limitations that we can see. Uh, often, they're going to be cards, or there are going to be things that if you mess them, it's on you. Like, unfortunately, uh, there are things that are not, like, coachable or that just shouldn't be missed. So, obvious limitations should just be, like, pay attention, you're going to see them. Uh, game limitations are things that we know about. They're not written like we're not necessarily reminded that they exist all the time but that's the way we play the game so that's something that should be uh unconsciously like known for us like we we shouldn't have a problem with it but we have to be aware of them when we build a deck and the ones that are very important and that we'll focus on later on today are the hidden limitations which are limitations that we endure that means that usually when we're going to build a deck we don't necessarily know about those limitations or it's the ones that are, the, are really easy to miss. And usually that can be the difference between a really good deck and an average deck or a bad deck because these hidden limitations that we didn't respect are going to make our deck be easily punished or not answer something that the game is pushing at the time. These kind of things. So let's start with the obvious limitations. And this was the best example I could find. If you play a Cerebro deck and you're playing cards with a ton of different power with no way to set them like Bast or like Valkyrie, unfortunately, it's on you. Like, your deck is not going to work or Cerebro is going to make no sense in that deck. But it's literally written on the card. So these are limitations that you should know about. Same for Mr. Negative. You want cards that have a lower power than their cost except if the ability is exceptionally good, which I think only Jane Foster has made it uh, in a 
Mr. Negative deck with that um, with higher power than cost. Uh, I don't. I can't recall another card at this point, but yeah, like these are obvious limitations. I don't expect it to be questions about these ones. It's literally things that are written on our screen, and we just have to respect it. Now we're gonna go. Oh damn! It. I had a game for it. Okay, I at least want to do that game. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna share the other one. Hopefully, it's gonna work. So. Uh, change. I'm going to share this one. Unfortunately, people at home, or like on YouTube, are not going to get the little game. Because they're going to get the answer. But that's okay. You should... Did the monitor change? Like, can you see the... Can you still see... Yeah, we're now... We're zoomed in on the slideshow you'd been showing, but without any of the uh, menus uh, of the software. Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to go into the Marvel Snap limitations. Actually, I can also change what I'm recording on OBS. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, no, screen. Let's make the game for everyone. Uh, there we go. Can we move this? Now we can do that. All right. Solving technical issues. Woohoo. All right. So we're at the Marvel Snap limitations. So the limitations are pretty obvious, and there are things that we know about. But the thing is, over time, the developers have given us ways to overcome these limitations. So that's kind of the game. So the first thing we're working with is we're working with energy. We have one, two, then up to six, which adds up to 21 energy total, except when we can cheat that. Do you have an idea how we can cheat energies? Um, well, we can either make cards cheaper or we can expand the amount of energy we have. Uh, well, or we can change the number of turns we have. Well, making cards cheaper doesn't change our total amount of energy. It changes the total mm -hmm. amount of... It changes the cost. It doesn't change the currency we use. So you mean how to increase the maximum yes. amount of energy can, we have? Can we get past uh, one? Sure. A card like Electro could do that. Um, uh, so in reality... You know, Psylocke, X23. In reality, Electro doesn't add more energies. Because Electro... Well, unless there's a specific scenario, but... Electro cost three, and it gives plus one on four, five, and six, which basically you could consider Electro to be a zero cost to power. Because you pay oh. three energy, and you're gaining three energy. What we're looking for is cards that are a net positive. Like, once you played Electro, okay, you didn't, like, you could consider you didn't pay for Electro, but remove Electro, you're still at 21. I see. So he doesn't add energy, he just lets you play two sixes or something like that. Yes, it changes... It cheats the curve. The, yeah, it changes the, the spread of energy, but he doesn't add energy. But there's, a okay. few, there's one card that adds energy. Um, I mean, you could consider X-23 see. if you manage to destroy her at least twice. Because the first time, she just pays back what you, what you pay to get her on board. Mm-hmm. Or if you, say, beast it, get it to, or get zero, um, well, once again, but you're, you're you want just a single card. You're changing cost. You're not changing energy. That's right. We're trying to impact energy. Mm -hmm. um, feels like I'm missing something obvious here. Yes. All right. Magic. <laughs> Magic costs three, and she gives you seven. Ah, changing the... I see, yeah, yeah. So magic is a net plus four. Like, when you play magic, you could argue I'm playing with 25. Your opponent as well. Like, arguably, you're giving seven to your opponent when you're only giving four to yourself. And four, you should get more than two power. So in reality, magic is a bad deal if you put it this way. Because you pay three, 
to get five, four energies and two power, and your opponent got seven energy. When you think about the fact that the average three cost is a three four, you should have like magic should be a three four for the deal to be the same. The thing is, in theory, your deck is ready for seven turns. Your opponent's deck isn't, and that's where you make up for that difference. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, yeah, like it's the same. Like some people would argue, Psylocke is giving you more energy. But it's kind of the same as Electro. You transfer energy. Because you paid 2 for a 1-1. One, one, and you got 1 for it. The thing is, a 1-1 one, one isn't worth 2 energy. Like, a 1-1 one, one isn't worth 1 energy in this game at this point. I mean, play 0. Play Watu is better than a 1-1. One, one, and it costs 1. So, these cards, they transfer energy. They don't buy you energy. Magic literally buys you energy. I see. Okay. This is already changing how I look at it. Thank you. Second limitation. Space. We only have 12 available spots. Except, what can we do to change that? Uh, well, we can decrease the number of spots, say, with like a Galactus or um, a Professor X. Yes. Um, we can use destroy or beast to clear up spots and restore them to us. Exactly. Like we can play with our spot. Like we can't increase the amount of spots, but we can clear them. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, for example, like a deck. So when you build a deck and you have no way of destroying, beasting, uh, moving around, like moving is a way to change the limit on space. That means you, have, you go into the game thinking, all right, I have 12 spots. And this is why, for example, cards like Brood are really good and really bad at the same time. They're really good because they fill a lot of space at the same time. And it makes it easier for you then to manage the rest of your spots. And usually it's a net negative to not have like your locations full at the end of the game. I mean, logically, every space should be points. So if you left a space you probably left points on the table but at the same time when you see you have three and three spaces out of four that are taken you're also limiting yourself uh, right next limitation card slots so we only are allowed 12 cards in our deck except so Thanos. yep yep i don't know who came in but that was Great entrance. <laughs> uh, there are other ways. So Thanos is the most known one, but there are many other ways, like Mirage, uh, all the um, Shield agents family, like Coulson, Agent Two Twelve, etc., etc. Uh, Ellie Carrier. Uh, we can have many more than twelve cards in our deck. I could have even put it maybe Kitty Pride. I'm not sure she enters here, but uh... all right. Then we have locations. We have three locations to play with, but we can do something to it. We can reduce the number of locations again with uh, Galactus or Professor X. We can change them with Magic or Scarlet Witch or Rhino or, um, you know, cards like that. So we can impact. So we can, so here we're, we don't have any way in the game to break that limitation positively. Like, we can gain energy, we can gain space, we can gain cards, but we cannot gain locations. I think that's one of the few things in the game that you cannot have more of. At least I've never seen it ever and don't think it's possible to get to four locations. Uh, you can multiply the effects of the locations with the Scarlet Witch and that kind of things. But you can't buy new locations. In order to have a new effect, you have to lose another effect. And then the last thing we're limited with are turns. And this one should be pretty obvious. Because <laughs> we already talked about it, so it's magic again. We yeah. can break that limitation. So when we look at these limitations, I don't think anyone is surprised at these game limitations. Like, I shouldn't have taught you anything here. 
Okay, so let's see if I can teach you something now. Um, <laughs> that's going to impact the way we play our, our decks and the way we build our decks. So there are two concepts that I really want to talk about first. The first one is curve and peak. So these are terms from the normal life, but they're adapted for card games. Does both of you know what a curve is or like to curve is or to peak? Yes. I wouldn't mind if you uh, went through it. Okay, so curving is using all your energies or, at or using your energies in the most efficient way every turn, which is also called playing tempo most of the time. Uh, the goal is I'm given 21 energy. If I use all my 21 energy, I should have done more than someone that uses 20 or 19 or 18 or 17. That's the goal of curving. And Marvel Snap is a little special in this way because the game is really short. But in other card games, you would associate the action of curving out to mid-range decks, where as much as you give them mana, they're going to use it to develop their units and to put more and more pressure. And the idea is on turn one, I get minimal pressure. On turn two, I get a little bit more. Turn three, I get a little bit more, etc., etc. So in Marvel Snap, it would be the same thing as playing a one-on-one, -on -one, a six-on-six, -six, and using all your energies every single turn. And the concept of peaking is the moment where your deck is at its best. Most of the time in Marvel Snap, I think most of the best decks are peaking on turn six because the earlier you peak, the more information you give to your opponent. Uh, right now, since the OTA, we have a, a little bit of a weird um, uh, of a weird play pattern, which some decks are peaking on turn three and four, which is Forge into Brood into Absorbing Man. That's the peak of like Surfer, or that's the peak of the new Patriot deck. Um, but because we're peaking early, we're revealing a lot about our limitations because that combo uses seven out of the 12 space we have, for example. So our opponent that probably can guess we didn't summon a five power brood in order to destroy it, they know that the location where we have brood and the location where we have absorbing man, we only have one space to play with. Are we cool on the definitions? Yeah. All right. Second ones, we have the setup and the comet, which is very similar to curve and peak. Uh, setup is preparing for your peak or playing cards which are non-committal. For example, Zabu is probably the best setup in the game at this point. Uh, it doesn't bring a lot of power, but when Zabu is, on, is in play, your deck is immensely better. And, I mean, Quinjet is the same. Uh, we could name Angela, for example. She's a setup. Uh, and the commit is the moment where you are showing which locations you want to contest. Like, the, where your opponent is playing Zabu doesn't tell you much except, oh, that guy has Zabu. But nobody's going to contest a location with a Zabu. Where your opponent plays Devil Dinosaur on turn 5 tells you much more about the locations they intend to win in the end. So that's the difference between a setup and a comet. In your deck, you're going to have cards that are intended to help the rest of your cards, and you have cards that are intended to win locations. The ones that are support, and the ones that are like, I call them carry, like I, I took the term from uh, League of Legends, but that <laughs> probably is a better word for that. Are we good on these two concepts? Yeah. So just so I can ask, um, so in this example, Wong would look like somebody that you're now committing to that lane, but if the purpose of it is to spread, say, White Tiger around, it could actually have just been set up. Exactly. Some cards can be okay. both. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, you have the same thing with uh, Iron Heart or, uh, or, or that kind of things, and, uh, and you have like cards that can change a setup into a Comet, like Valkyrie. For example, for a very long time, uh, Valkyrie negative decks was great because you would just go like Psylocke into negative and your opponent would be like, well, that lane is an easy win. And then you just Valkyrie on turn six and they're like, oh, that wasn't a setup. <laughs> or like it's a, it's a mix. It's a both. That kind of thing. But like, for example, the biggest commit in the game, although Jeff might have a say in this, is Professor X. 
Professor X is the commit in Marvel Snap. It's the, I want this location, and I want it now, and then it's closed. Alright, and that brings us to things that we already talked about, which is core, flex, and tech. So when we build our deck, we have all these little concepts in mind, and that's going to tell us cards we need, and that's going to tell us cards we want. Cards we need are going to go into our core, cards we want are going to be flexible or tech cards. All right. Are we clear on those like game limitations and how they push us to play? Oh, good. Okay, so up until this point, we didn't have things that I think you didn't necessarily know, like maybe the vocabulary, but otherwise, these are concepts that with a little bit of time and thinking about it, you can come up with. Like when you build your deck, you come up with the idea, which you either have a deck that's gonna curve or that's gonna peak, for example. Uh, so your idea is to develop all through the game or your idea is going to be to explode at some point in the game you're going to have cards that are called support cards you're going to have cards that are called bring me points and win me locations so that's the setup and the comet and all these cards are going to be spread around your core your flex and your tech card so up until this point these are all things we've done we're just presenting them in a different way so they make sense regarding what the game is asking us to do in order to win a match now, there are limitations, which nobody's telling us about, and if we don't look for it, or we don't get our ass kicked by it a few times, we don't know. For example, the metagame. When we build a deck, currently in Marvel Snap, if your deck is weak to Shang-Chi, you have a really good chance it's going to be a bad deck, because everyone is playing Shang-Chi. And that's a hidden limitation. That's something that doesn't really exist. Like... No one in Second Dinner ever said, hey guys, let's make it so that every card that is 9 or plus isn't that good in the end. No, we just gave it a tool, and I mean, the rule is to win with more points than your opponent, so obviously cards that are going to bring you a lot of points are interesting, and it just happens that there's a card that says you're allowed to have a lot of points, just don't go too high, otherwise I'm going to punish you. But it's really important to know the metagame, because the metagame is a big hidden limitation. And the second one, and this is one that I usually get a lot of uh, complaints about, or people don't want to see it in a lot of time, and that's the biggest one to me, it's ourself. When we build a deck and we play our first games, we're very likely not going to play the deck very well. And that's a limitation that we need to accept and that we need to like understand that there's a learning curve. We can't be absolute gods that know everything about the game on day one and know how to play a deck perfectly on day one. Which means we can't be critical about the deck after just a few games. Because maybe it's not the game, maybe it's us, maybe we're just one card or two cards away and the idea was really good but the flex cards are not good or the tech cards are not good or we didn't just take one element, which was like the metagame, we didn't account for one very annoying card, which, for example, could be shang -Chi. but then we just change our deck, get Cosmo in it, solve the shang problem, and suddenly our deck is killing it. So we have to give us a little break, because that's probably one of the biggest limitations, and we tend to judge decks way too quickly. And uh, I'll, I'll finish with a quote, because it's like kind of trendy. But, and that's a really big one when we play, which is every li limitation we reveal early is a, weapon, is a weapon our opponent can use against us. It goes without saying. Which means, if we go back to uh, the game limitations, if I fill up my, my 12 space by turn 4, my opponent can literally play 2 turns for free. And the only thing they have to do is bit my point because they know I can't play cards anymore. If I use all the cards I have in hand, and that was another limitation, but drawing, we draw one card per turn, but there are several ways of drawing and locations are impacting and everything, so I didn't include in the limitations. But if on turn six I have one card in hand, obviously I'm gonna be less of a threat than if I had like five or six because my possibilities 
are um, much easier, like but much more limited. Um, so there are a ton of examples like this where every deck has to play by some limitations and every deck is trying to break others. Like destroy is going to be really good to play with space. Um, some decks are going to have incredible f turn 4, 5, and 6 when others are just going to have a really good turn 6 but they have a better setup in return. And this is probably why... Um, this is probably why flexible decks have almost always been amongst the best in Marvel Snap. Is because if you have a flexible deck that is going to peak on turn 6, that is going to Comet on turn 6, and which has a lot of cards going into turn 6 with a lot of space available, you haven't shown any limitation to your opponent. They don't know where you're going to play, they don't know which cards you're going to play, they don't know you're going to spread your points, they don't know if you're going to go proactive, they don't know if you're going to go reactive, and so it's really difficult for them to get clues on where are your limitations because you kept every option open. Obviously, that opens counters because typically these kind of decks haven't used their energy really well. This is why at some point a lot of Sarah decks just instantly died to wave because you kept a lot of options in your hand. You didn't use your energy efficiently, and suddenly Wave says, we're not going to use it efficiently on 6, when your whole game plan relies on being super effective on 6 to make up for all the energies you haven't used up until this point. So, usually, when we build a deck, and even more importantly, when we're trying to counter a deck, every deck has limitations. It's just, how can we find them? And more importantly, how can we abuse them? But I haven't seen one deck that isn't limited one way or another. And that was the end of the tier report, if anyone has any questions about this. This might be um, a large topic on its own, but when we think about energy economy um, and the fact that you know, we have 12 cards usually in our deck, you know, four of them will be available to us on the first turn. Um, so we could think about, if I want to curve out correctly, what is the proportion of, say, one cost cards, two cards, cost cards you should have in order to give you not a perfect chance, but like a really solid chance of having energy efficient things to do each turn. And obviously, depending on the kind of deck, you know, that math gets blown up completely. But is there something like a default ratio of ones to twos to threes? Uh, when the game started, a lot of people just played two cards of each. Um, then the thing is you can cheat certain turns. Like, for example, if you play Chavez, you know you're going to have a six. It's not a great six, but you know you're going to have it. Um, then we have cards that are going to generate... So you can actually cheat some turns. Uh, you have cards that are going to change the cost of your cards. Like, for example, Zabu decks only play one tree because typically when you have Zabu, your turn tree is a, turn, is a four cost. Um, so it's really difficult to say, like if, like, if we were in a vanilla game, I would say probably something like three ones, two of each one six. But... We are not, we've not been in a vanilla game for a very long time now. So, I mean, we could look at decks, and that's probably going to be a better way to, to explain this, because otherwise my answer would just be, it depends. is probably the best answer, but at the same time, one that doesn't give you a lot about to, to, to go about. Like, uh, Fair enough. All right. Uh, I'll just go with the decks that are in my collection. So... For example, let's go with this one. So here, you can see that I have a lot of 1s, a lot of 2s, no 5s. So I actually have a lot of 1s, 2s, and 3s, basically. And then 1, 4, no 5s, 2, 6s. Why? Because I have Beast. So actually, my 1, 2, 3s, I can reuse and make them 4 and 5s. So because I have this card that is telling me... Oh, my game is in French. I hope it's not a problem. I believe everyone knows what beast does yeah all right um so because i have beasts i can actually tell my cheap cards hey you're going to be turn one and turn four or you're going to be turn one and turn five or you're going to be turn two and turn five 
So this is one of the ways I can cheat my curve. But because I have Beast, my limitation is I need to play enough cards that are interesting to bounce with Beast. Like if I'm playing like, I'm, I'm just going to remove Human Torch, for example, and I'm going to remove uh, Forge. I'm just going to play with Ghost Rider, Iron Fist, and I'm just going to make it a super big multiple man deck. Well, suddenly I have removed cards that are interesting to Beast. So unless I get perfect one, two, three, so I get like, I don't know, Iron Fist into multiple man, uh, into Hulkbuster, suddenly Beasting isn't so interesting because I didn't get enough targets. So this is one way to play with your energy is you get cards that are going to be used in several turns. Uh, now we have this one, which is a create cards. So first we can see Kitty Pride and Kitty Pride just says, don't worry, pal, you're going to have something to play all the time. And because we're in the Devil Dinosaur topic, you get this other one, which is... Where are you, Sentinel? You have these kind of cards, which are saying... Like, basically, you could say, Kitty Pride and Sentinel, you can play up until turn 5. Like, turn 1, Kitty Pride. Turn 2, Sentinel. Turn 3, Kitty Pride, Sentinel. Turn 4, still Kitty Pride, Sentinel. Turn 5, you're starting to miss a lot of energy, so you probably want to start playing more cards. But that's another way you can cheat your energies where you're like, as long as I have Kitty Pride or Sentinel, and if I have both, my first four turns are cool. Um, obviously, you can also create cards with like Nick Fury. I could have mentioned like Coulson. I could have mentioned Mirage, that kind of things. So that's another way to cheat. Uh, now let's go to a deck that does not cheat. For example, here. And for example, here, you can see I literally do not have a one. So I go into each and every game, and I know I am not playing turn one. Is that a problem? No. Because I have cards like Brood, I have cards like Absorbing Man, I have cards like Spider-Man, which means I want space on my locations. I want to be able to move around, I want to be able to summon three cards at once and not be blocked. So unless I would have a disposable one cost, which is usually Nova with Killmonger, and we're back to that destroy port, which allows me to cheat on space, I will often be annoyed by my one, because let's imagine, I don't know, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to take Nebula Sunspot, because their power can change, so they're strong in that regard, but let's say my one is Iceman. I play Iceman on turn one, and I'm really happy, it's a really good turn one. The problem is now, can I really play Brood or Absorbing Man on the same Iceman locations? Like, do I want to tell my opponent on turn 3 or turn 4, hey, this location is full for me, I'm done. I mean, it's really easy for them to know how many points I'm going to have there. Like, if it's Brood, they see 8, and then they can add Silver Surfer so they can see 6. So they're like, okay, my target is 8 or 14, so I go to 9 or 15. And suddenly for a one cost, which is not a bad one cost. I mean, the card is great. But in exchange for that card, I'm putting a lot of limitations on my deck related to space. So here, I don't mind losing the one, but then it's going to be a big problem if I start missing the next ones, which is why I have two twos. And maybe if it wasn't a surfer deck that would tell me play a lot of trees, uh, I would even have three because I would make sure I want to start playing on turn two and then my goal is to go 2 into 3, into 4, into 5, and into 6. But here, I can allow to skip turns, because skipping turns means saving space, and I need that space for Brood, Absorbing Man, or to be flexible when I get Sarah on my turn 6. So, we saw the first two examples was, how do I create cards to get better use of my energy? Surfer is more of a deck where... I don't need all my energy because I have cards that are going to take a lot of space. Um, then I could go with uh, a destroy deck. And here, my curve is this guy. I have stones. So obviously because I have stones, I know I can play less once. But then as you can see, I'm playing two twos, a ton of three, and then deck cards. So the way my curve is going to look like is I'm going to play a stone. Then I'm going to play either Bucky Barnes or two stones or like a stone in X23. Turn three, I don't want to miss. Turn four, I'm likely playing a stone plus a tree because I have like five, five trees and six stones. So it's 
pretty likely that I get both. And then turn 5, um, I'll see. And the other thing is, because I have X23 and because I have Time Stone, I can cheat my way into skipping a turn that doesn't look good to go directly to Professor X or go directly to Magneo and Thanos or go to a Bucky Barnes Deathlock on 5 if I can like build something with my cheaper cards. So here, I would say the very important part is to not miss any of my first three turns, which is why I have a lot of ones through the stones. I don't have that many twos because I have so many ones that I can build a two. I can double one or two. And then I have a lot of trees. And once I'm out this port, which I need to be explosive, I'm going to start entering the port where I'm more flexible with, my, with the way I want to use my energy. And that's going to depend like... Do I still have space? So did I get my destroy card? So I have a lot of space so I can keep using it. Or did I miss on my destroys? So I need to save space and probably go towards my big cards, which are worth a lot of points or Professor X to lock a lane. And the space that I lost using my stones and chip cards, my opponent is going to lose it as well because I'm going to Professor X that lane anyway. Does that make sense? Very helpful, thanks. Okay. Uh, I have one more, but I don't know if we get anything from it. Uh, it's the new deck that... And see here, it's going to be a very similar idea to Surfer in the end. I don't have a one, because Forge Brood Absorbing Man takes up so much space that using energy for a one is probably not going to net me as many points as if I just skip it and get my combos off. So then is one way to analyze decks that you're building, kind of imagine you've got, um, you know, the perfect draw. It goes exactly the way you want. How many points are you building in each lane? Um, and then now start imagining worser draws or, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, not how to make it more reliable, but like, oh, wait, how much does this depend on getting absolutely the perfect draw? If it's way too focused on that, it's going to be a bad deck. Um, so I can see how you'd criticize it, but then how do you know what to add back in? Um, or what to substitute, I mean. I need to go to the PowerPoint for that. Fair Second. enough. Two. Curve and Peak, Setup and Comet. <laughs> so you probably start with the core, which, is, which the core tells you what you want to drive a single game. Like, with the Surfer or the Patriot deck, you probably just go uh, Forge into Brood, into Absorbing Man, if you can, every single game. And that's my core. Then, we can go two directions. We can think about what if my core is not enough, and then the flex is going to be support. Or we can go, what if I don't draw into my core, and then my flex is going to be a different game plan. And so, for example... Here, because I'm peaking extremely early, I'm peaking on 2, 3, and 4, I don't need that much curve. If I was peaking on 6, then I would probably need curve, so I'm not literally passing my turn. But here, my peak is early, so I don't need to focus on curve. So I can focus on support, or I can focus on a different peak. Which, does the deck have one? Well, you could focus on a different peak, which would be like Mr. Sinister, Dazzler, Iron Lad. And then you go back to it on like turn six, where you go like Sinister, Dazzler, Lad, Blue Marvel. And then turn six, you can Brute Patriot, for example. Plus Wasp or something like that. So it's to answer your question, I think your core tells you that. Like, is your core... Your curve is your core, your peak is your core, a setup is your core, a comet. In the Forge Brood uh, Absorbing Man example, the, um, the core is a comet and a peak. So my flex is a little bit of curve in case I don't get it, and mostly a setup. Like if I get back to it. Patriot is a setup. Nobody ever won a lane by playing Patriot only. Dazzler is a setup. Nobody ever won a lane with Dazzler not activated. 
and Iron Lad, well, try playing Iron Lad in a deck with cards that are not worth copying, and you just have a 4 6. Does it answer your question? Yes, absolutely. This is, this is the kind of logic and trade offs that uh, I've been missing and really, really help. And then the last thing, obviously, always keep the metagame in mind. Mm -hmm. Because, like, these are the rules. And then the metagame is kind of the gatekeeper. If your card doesn't make sense in a card metagame, it can have, like, it can respect all the limitations, all the rules. If it gets punished every time, it's not worth it. All right. Uh, it's been a little under an hour, but it feels good for a little break because we talked a lot. And then we're actually going to do it. So I hope you're ready to build decks. Which are going to make sense this time. <laughs> so it's 11.55 at my watch. Uh, five minute break. Let's come back for midnight. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. You in a bit? des trucs que je dois pas voir. I'm back.
I realized I was probably not sharing the right screen. Explaining on the PowerPoint. You mean in the last few minutes? Uh, not during the break, before, when I answered your question. Were you still seeing the, the my right screen? Like, were you seeing the, the Discord or that kind of stuff? Or were you seeing the PowerPoint while I was explaining it? I saw a much smaller version of this screen, but it was enough to work it out. And then at the last okay. minute or so, you went back to the slides. Okay, then, yeah. So it looked, it looked right to me. Okay, okay, because I was... Uh... I remember to change the screen on the recording, but I forgot to do it. Ah. Uh, all right, Bishop, are you back with us? Yeah, I'm here. All right. I'm trying to. I'm, re I'm repairing a stove at the same time. So, but um, no worries. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll start with an example, and then you guys can do it. And uh, Lockjaw is good for that purpose because it's really easy to understand. So Iceman or Spider Ham can be whatever. I just like the new skin, so I'm I'm playing Iceman just because I like the skin, the the variant. Like, don't put too much attention into it. So, why is Lockjaw so simple to understand? Because it's everything at the same time. The deck goal is to curve for turn 3 up to turn 6. And it does it based on a commit that happens on turn 3, which is Lockjaw or Tor. Wherever Lockjaw or Tor end up, you pretty much know your, the, the deck is going to try and win that lane. So... You start with telling the opponent pretty much all your strategy. Yet, the idea is, I care so little about the limitations of this game, you can't beat me. Because we talked about magic, but Lockjaw is probably a card that cheats energy much more than magic does. Because whenever you pay for Wasp, you get a 6 or a 5 or even a 4. We said magic was a plus 4 energy. Wasp is a plus 4 energy every time it goes behind Lockjaw. So if we go back to our uh, concepts, between curve and peak, the goal is to get a peak and just maintain it through curving. So I peak on turn 3 and then I just maintain it for 4, 5 and 6. And then set up and comet, it's also both at the same time. Because Lockjaw and Tor are setup cards. Because when I play them, neither of them is gonna win. But later in the game, you realize that where both cards were played were probably the locations the Lockjaw deck was gonna attack. And this is why, for example, it's so hard to change a card in Lockjaw. Because you need to find a card that does everything. You need to find a card that's worth curving, but that can also be a peak if it comes out of Lockjaw. I need to find a card that serves as a setup, but can still be a comet towards points. Take, for example, I guess High Evolutionary is the only setup card, and the goal of the card is to not be played, so I'm gonna leave it out. But if we take Dracula, I mean, it's a setup, because you don't know how big Dracula is gonna be. But you know it's going to be big enough that if you don't contest it, it's going to be difficult. Jane Foster is a setup. It draws Mjolnir for Lockjaw and Tor. Yet, 8 power is big enough to be a Comet if I play anything alongside it on the next turn. Or if I play it on Dracula's Lane or behind Jubilee. And same for all these big cards. Chavez is a commit. I mean, 9 points is pretty okay. But it's also a setup. Because it's in the deck because it makes Lockjaw and Tor more reliable. Hulk is kind of a pure comet, but it can also be a peak because as soon as it comes out of Lockjaw, I'm going to snap. Magneto is flexible because it can be a points card or it can be a disruption card because it's going to move around a lot of cards for my opponent in this kind of metagame where there are a lot of trees and a lot of four cards cards. So it's kind of the same thing. 
if I pick, if I get it off Lockjaw and I move cards on turn four or five and it locks their lane, it's a pick. But it's good enough that I can curve it on turn six. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And this is probably why Lockjaw has survived all this time. Is the deck barely cares about the game's limitation. It cheats energy. It doesn't need much space. It barely regards which turn we are to summon cards at various prices. Uh, his energy is absolutely not based on which turn we are at. Like, if you lock your Wasp an Infinite, that's probably your best turn in the game, and there's still, like, turn 4, 5, and 6 to come. Um... And the deck can play three locations, because if you go Lockjaw into Tor, you have a setup on two lanes. And if you play Galactus against Lockjaw, well, they can still kind of challenge it with just Hulk. So when you look at limitations, and then you look at the Lockjaw deck, you're just like, you really don't care about being limited. And that's true. So why is Lockjaw not the best deck in the game? Well, Lockjaw is not the best deck in the game, because the limitations are not just based on the game. It's also based on the metagame. And in the metagame, there's a little guy that's saying, Lockjaw, I'm just gonna wreck any lane I'm played on. And that's the end of my TED Talk. <laughs> uh, Alright. Anyone has a deck that they want to try to do this little concept on? And we try to work on which limitations the deck might have? I do. Alright. I have a... I'm kind of playing with. Let me do you want figure to send, out how to. Do you want to send in the chat and I put it on the screen, or do you want to share your screen? Uh, I can do either one. Um, maybe let's see. Let's just share the screen then, huh? Oops, maybe I didn't do that right. I'm stuck in this. Nope. How do you share your screen? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the way to do it. A little back. Did you bug when you tried to share your screen? I'm trying to figure out yeah, which key, which, I mean, which one, what is it? What's that under? Is it? Or... For me, it's the bottom left. It looks like a monitor with a little arrow pointing to the right. I would always just send the deck in the group coaching. Yeah, I can probably do that. That's Let me easier. Grab I'll a just copy show it on screen. That's not a problem. It'll just be a little annoying if we have to do some gameplay, but I guess I can, uh, I, c I can be your hand. Or if it's any easier, like, you can also send the code of the deck and I can just build it and it'll be on screen as well. Ah! Alright, do you have a deck, Silvermint? And we'll, we'll give him time that way so he can... Uh... Sure, yeah. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I don't know why it won't let me do this. It's, it's, it's alright, don't worry. Like we, we can start with Silvermint so you have time to... To figure it out, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll switch to you whenever you're ready. All right. All right. So let's see. There's a number um, I'm working on. I think after last week, probably folks don't want to watch a Cerebro deck. Um, so one thing we could try. Um, I'm toying with the idea that you know with 
the new cards coming out, a lot of people will be running Cosmo or Armor. Um, and if they're running Cosmo and Armor to try to block those cards, um, is there a way to get something like a Surfer ongoing um, that really only needs one lane to play Reveals, um, but otherwise benefits from that kind of metagame? Well, I think that's called Patriot Surfer. Well, okay, fair enough. So not so much I'm um, toying with as trying to reinvent the wheel worse. Um, so let me copy this real quick. Because uh, otherwise it's a surfer deck for ongoings. Uh, surfer deck for ongoings. So These are all the ongoings at a tree cost. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one that could be more fun, um, maybe, it's just, I'm really speculating now, is something like a Destroy Surfer that's going to be trying to use Sabertooth, um, Deathlock, Venom, um, X-23, these kinds of cards. Um, you think it's being built one way, and then it gets um, a Surfer reveal at the end. That might be fun to play up. Okay. So, let's try to build it. So what's the core? What am I starting with? All right, so um, I have uh, oh, just the core, or do you want the cards I currently have? Oh, if you, ha if you have a build already, go for it. Sure. Um, so what I'm tinkering with at the moment, um, Nova, um, X-23. Uh, Got filters. So, Nova. Hey, can, I, can I ask, instead of doing it this way, since you brought up the core, I, I know so you already have the core. Can we try and guess? I'm, I'd like to be able to think of the package from the way I would start. And so if you're saying the core, this is a Surfer Destroy deck, right? So this would be like Surfer, Venom. Am I starting to understand here what you mean by the core? Um, um. Yeah, the the core the core of the deck is the most important core is the one you want to work with every single time. But the thing is here, like I don't want to spend too much time on like the building of the deck as much as the limitations when we have it no, once we have it built. All right. So given that, um, I've got Carnage and Surfer. Uh, Carnage. I guess we're gonna have a lot of trees. So. Mm -hmm. uh, where is Surfer? Uh, Can we remove the visual effects anyway? Uh, okay. Uh, Killmonger, Venom, Dakin. Uh, Sabretooth. Uh, uh. And so these last four, I think, are. Um, no Deathlock? Well, let me add a... Let, oh, well, I have Deathlock and Absorbing Man. Let's see where you're at right now. Like, uh, two, 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 absorbing Man, okay. And I think Death, um, just for hopefully free points on the end. Uh, okay. Do we have anything else? And I was... I was tinkering with Phoenix Force just to try to bring one of these cards back, maybe then destroy it again for even more value, but then I feel like, well, you really want to null, and then you're kind of changing the, the Surfer Core. Um, I think what I really need is more cheap things to destroy, honestly. Yeah, because right now it doesn't seem like your death is going to get a lot of work in, to be honest. We could try destroying a brood just for the surprise of it. Um, and then worst case scenario, we have a surfer backup. This is kind of what I was going to offer, but unfortunately, okay. like, you already have Absorbing Man and Daken and Sabretooth are pretty good with uh, Forge as well. It looks like you're going to end up with Forge Brood in your deck. There. Uh, wait, it was Brood. But what can we remove for Brood? Because we're going to be full. Well, if we want those surprise points at the end, Sabretooth has a benefit, but only four points worth. Otherwise, he doesn't really count towards the, the death total. Uh, I, I think maybe Sabretooth. 
Sabretooth is really a null card. Uh, like, if you don't have null, yeah. Sabretooth is a little bit. Yeah. Uh, here. Alright, so that's what we would be working with. So. Uh, so, you shouldn't have space problems, because the, the Brood Absorbing Man space is compensated by the by the destroy part, you kind of have to be careful about X-23 not going on a brood or an absorbing man lane. That's very, like, marginal. Like, very scarce as a scenario. Uh, can we discard death enough? Like, how much do we want to pay death? Max 4? So we guess if we get to destroy X-23, that means we have 7 on turn 6, so we can play death plus surfer. So if we're going for this, where are the four destroys? You could not know. I mean, if you look at Venom onto Ven Venom onto Brood or Carnage onto Brood, I mean that gives you Venom gives you what six plus three. That's nine plus three cards towards destroy towards death. So that's your four. Yes, but that also costs you at least four points that you're not going to get on Surfer. Right. Um, hmm. So it would be one for no... Well, then you're probably not going to... It depends when you play the Nova too, right? So, um, so Nova X23... That's two points there. If you forge the brood, you get um, a little bit extra for the venom. Yeah, but you also give your opponent a Nixel, uh, a great Shangxi target. That's true. That's true. Hmm. Mm. Do we need Bucky in this deck? Considering on turn three, because like right now our goal on turn three is to either go like if for two was forge. We want to go Brood or Daken. But then, if for tree is Deathlock or Venom, do we want a target, which would be Bucky? Your goal for the Nova is to play it at the end, right? It was to kill it at the end, right? To kill Monger at the end. It's the goal, one, but in a destroy deck, are you going to be able to do so? A, be goofy, <laughs> a goofy thought could be Mirage, um, both because it's cheap to destroy on its own, and it'll give you something with higher points that's usually cheap that you can then also destroy. Yeah, but then I feel like you have Bucky Barnes, which is that in one card, and you don't have to pay for the card Mirage gives you. Fair. But it's always the same question, is what can we can move for? Do you remove Forge, then? Because Forge well, builds your... That, and... That's where we get two curves. Like, you get the Forge into Brood Daken and Absorbing Man, so that's one. And then you get the other one with Bucky into Venom Deathlock or something like that. Gotcha, I see. So then it's looking like... It's looking like Death is a hard... Is your... Is... Yeah, well, maybe this doesn't want to run that. Well, the thing is, we would help the destroy port and remove death. Feels weird. Yeah. I'm almost wondering if it's not Nova that well, we want to get out. I mean, so this seems like it's aiming for fewer points than a typical surfer. Maybe what we want is something like a wave to limit their turn. Um, then we can destroy the wave. Um, and so we're contesting really a couple of locations with unusually tall threes. But then, staying yeah, chewable, then so... If, if you wave, you're going both ways. You just remove death. You're doing, you're doing, what, wide, but, you know, one tall lane, maybe, and a couple of wide lanes, and trying to go mm -hmm. wide at the same time? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the, because that's what Surfer does best, right? Just kind of yeah. go high and wide. And then death is, I mean, then destroy goes high once. Because you're not running, you're not running the Zola package where you're trying to go hide in two lanes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we want things that are like Maximus that are just, you know, high point totals then can be destroyed. Um, or gosh, I don't know. Maybe we even want like an ebony maw that you killmonger, um, so that restores the lane to you. Why do you want to destroy high points cards? I don't get it. This is a death, not a no. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you want to help the death, five. it's Yondu that you play as a one because that's two destroyed. Mm -hmm. So then Nova goes out and we go Yondu? I mean, on my own, I would play Bucky Barnes over Nova. Yeah. Because both cards are likely to do the same thing. Except <laughs> you just have to play Bucky into destroy it rather than have the old Nova, play it at the end, etc, etc. Well, and I guess the next question is, is X-23 bias a lot? I think X-23 is the best one cost for destroy, but that's up for debate. Because, like, your turn 6, as you said, is Surfer Death. So if you have Surfer Death on turn 6, when do you get the Nova Killmonger synergy? On turn 5? Mm. Yeah, you'd have to play it then, which means you'd be playing, but then you'd want Killmonger plus a 2-drop, right? Like, plus Carnage? Well, that's the Or thing. Bucky... Bu right. Or, or you're going to forge into forge into Death or forge into Surfer? Because, <laughs> I mean, at the same time, we can keep the the logic of Surfer, and the logic of Surfer has always been, like, a 1... One or two twos, we already have one too much, but maybe that's okay, because we're a different kind of build. And then death is basically Sarah, that's the way we cheat energies. And absorbing men is just really good, and we have a ton of unrevealed. Yeah, I think... So the more I'm looking at this, the it feels like what's holding it back is the surfer. The the mere coincidence that there's some three destroy cards probably isn't enough. Um given that the whole logic of surfer is to keep those threes, like you said, and grow them. Well that's the thing, is like okay. you need to find cards that are worth destroying outside mm -hmm. the surfer synergy. That's why we want an X twenty three, Bucky Barnes, that kind of thing. Because like in the is end, this... like what would be let, let's let's build the perfect scenario where we're like okay we love this deck. So obviously there's like forge into brood into absorbing men. We have destroyed absolutely zero cards, but we don't really care. Like we could go forge brood absorbing men. Turn five is like Bucky Barnes Deathlock or Bucky Barnes Venom or Bucky Barnes Carnage. We don't really care. Oh, it's even better if we go X twenty three Bucky Barnes Carnage. Because then we have seven energy. We destroyed three cards. So she's a five, so that doesn't work. But then we can go like Silver Surfer plus Killmonger, probably on turn six, something like that. So then when are we playing Dakin? When we don't get Brood. <laughs> Dakin yeah. is Brood number two in the Forge Dakin Absorbing Man kind of. Gotcha. And then, you're, and then X-23 is important. Because the 7 energy allows you to go shard Killmonger Surfer on the same turn. Because if you get Daken to like a 14 or something like that before turn 6, Shang-Chi comes around. Mm -hmm. So we have this one, which is basically the Surfer part. And then the other curve would be what? X-23, Bucky Barnes. We could even Daken then because it's not buffed so it doesn't fear shang chi and then turn four is like shard plus carnage deathlock or venom turn five well then turn five you can go forge brood for example and did you get enough destroys ah you didn't get death i think one two three so no, turn five we need to destroy again 
that's the thing is like i don't see a scenario yeah. where we yeah. get four destroys three destroys is really easy but four destroys means we have to commit the whole game plan to it and then surfer isn't good enough but you could argue that you don't necessarily need it oh wait no mm. we can get four destroys with x23 we go x23 into bucky barnes into Daken, into shard plus destroy it and then the next turn you just go carnage plus brood you don't forge just carnage plus brood again on x23 and so you get your fourth destroy you have seven energy and you can go surf for death But then Carnage can't be buffed by Surfer. Nope. Yeah. No, Carnage is here for the destroy port. Mm hmm mm hmm Do we have trees that would be better than Carnage? I mean, then you have Wave. But if you go Wave, you have to remove Death. Because the idea would be to... Go yeah. not like just go forge into brood into absorbing man into wave and then turn six is surfer and you're just like you never matching it. What if we threw in Thanos just to give us a bunch of stones to destroy? Yes, but then all the curves that we mentioned are way less likely to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, well, I mean, you're back to this, honestly. Yeah, that's and, right. and then, like, then Thanos and Silver Surfer don't mesh very well, I find, because Surfer wants room and Thanos takes it up. I mean, if you really oh. want it, I could play the deck this way. Yeah. And we're back to the sure. Thanos idea. Like, what th about. This is Absorbing Man, and we have basically. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. That's right. Um, what about Gambit? Um, we've been focusing on destroying our own cards. Gambit? Okay, but what do we take out? Because the thing is, Gambit is supposed to help death, right? Yeah. But that means, if you have death in hand, Gambit can just literally throw it off. Yep, yep, Because yep. you can never play death before Gambit. Hmm. I mean, we could test it this way and see how it goes. Sometimes it's just when you're stuck, just play a couple of games and see what happens. Fair enough. I'm, I'm also finding this exercise just very useful for seeing why the deck is going to struggle. It, it goes back to it changes the logic of Surfer with not enough return for your deviation. Well, first, there's oh. that problem when you're trying to build a deck based on a known concept. You're bound to compare. And when you're comparing your idea to a top-tier deck, obviously it's hard. <laughs> like you, you haven't chosen, like, the easiest one. Uh, but yeah, here, mm -hmm. I guess, limitations. We have kind of... We're struggling to find how we use our energies properly. Mm -hmm. Especially regarding to death. So maybe we just cut death in the end, we don't know. Like, do we play Null instead? Can we get Null yeah. big enough? And so sometimes we're just like, well, we don't have Surfer, so we're just going to drop Null and go win a lane, buddy. Can I ask a question about the death? Did you consider the meta and how often Killmonger is going to pick up one drop somewhere else? No. Ah. Uh -huh. Because... No. no. No, I didn't consider it. That's opportunistic. But see, that's the part where we have to go play and see. Right. Because if I look at the meta right now, what do we expect to see where Killmonger is a plus one? And also, okay, so Killmonger helps death. So let's, I'm just going to throw a random number. Uh, Killmonger picks up two destroys on average, okay? Yeah. Where in my curve do I play the card? So where I'm at, like, when I'm doing Forge, Brood, Absorbing Man, Killmonger is only available on five. Right. But then if I go Bucky Barnes, Killmonger, I kill stuff, but I don't kill Bucky Barnes. So my five is what? So even, let's say it's perfect scenario. X23, Forge, Brood, Absorbing Man. Then my five is Carnage on Forge and X23, and then Killmonger again to kill X23 a second time. And that's like the absolute nuts. 
But then I got three destroys, if I'm not mistaken. Which means Killmonger needs to kill at least... Oh no, actually with three destroys it works because I would have eight energies. So I could go... I was going to say, yeah. Okay, well that's, yeah. The, that's the super nuts. But okay, it works. So that's mm. one point for Killmonger. Now let's imagine if I don't have X-23. So I could just go Forge into Brood, into Absorbing Man. Killmonger needs to pick up... There's no amount of destroy Killmonger can pick up, so death. He needs to pick up at least, like... Because I wouldn't have the extra energy, so he needs to pick up five destroys. What are we playing against? Kazoo? <laughs> yeah. So... Maybe Thanos. That's yeah. the, I mean, Killmonger has always been like that. But it feels like in the deck, if we don't get X-23... Yep. Killmonger will never pick up enough on the open side. And you also have to consider that in the metagame, a lot of decks are already one expecting destroys. So yep. it's extremely rare you're going to see a Sunspot or a Nebula without armor as a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Two, Killmonger is already in a lot of decks. Like, yeah. Surfer is already running yep. it. Uh, good card still has stuff like this. So... Killmonger is expected. At the moment you reveal Bucky Barnes or that kind of things, people yep. are going to expect Killmonger. So, can we really expect the card to reliably pick up enough destroys? Probably not. Honestly, yeah. I, I'm just staring at the, the right hand of the screen also. Like, now I'm wishing there was some way to use wave magic to get an early Ultron, destroy your own ones with Killmonger, and then surprise with Null and Death. Um, yeah, but then like Surfer never, never fits into yeah, it. It's way too complicated. Hon hon yeah, honestly, it's no longer a Surfer deck, yeah. But this, this has been useful for me just to see how we calculate these trade-offs. Um, I feel like the upside is not very high on this deck. Well, the upside is flexibility. Because now you have two finishers. You have Death or Surfer. And when the stores align, you get both. So that could be something. Now the question you have to ask yourself, I'll go to this one. It's not for necessarily standard, is uh, just for the exercise, I'll put in Null instead of Magneto. So usually, it's Null and Death, right? Mm-hmm. How much is it worth to replace Null with Surfer, which affects your entire deck? But you, you rarely get to play both. Like, in this one, I'm confident I'm often going to get Null plus Death. Mm -hmm. In yours, we have showed that it's pretty difficult to get Surfer and Death at the same time. Now, there's one thing that we didn't account in the current metagame. Destroy is really popular. So maybe the opponent just gives us death, and we don't even have to work for it. Honestly, I've been thinking that any you know box standard deck that just throws in death and null as cheap ways to get points by surprise when it doesn't look like it's playing a destroy deck um, would be kind of fun. And now there's another thing, and so here we're going to meta game. Mm -hmm. How much do you think? Someone stays in the game when you go Forge Brood Absorbing Man nowadays. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that may be a question of what level you're playing at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they think you're playing a standard surfer, they are probably cal calculating lanes. Can I go over the top or not? Um, and so then the only way you can surprise them is playing by playing different points in different lanes. Um, Which is exactly what this deck does. Yeah. Or, you know, at that point, they're hoping that they have a Cosmo that they can drop on you and stop the Surfer reaction. Um, and then it turns out you were playing Death, but... I don't know, it feels... You taught us on the first uh, session that, you know, calculate what kind of decks you're going to face in the metagame, and if your opportunity range is too narrow, it's not worth... You know, you have to win a certain percentage of games. And this feels like, if I've got somebody who thinks they can beat Surfer based on points and location control, 
and everything goes my way, I surprise them by contesting different points in different ways, um, or different lanes in different, you know, then it, it feels like a very, very narrow case. So the idea of the deck well, is, the hey, question... a lot of destroy cards are threes, but that's not enough. Oh, sorry, I, go ahead. I, I think you're not asking the question the right way. Yes, it's a narrow case, mm -hmm. but you're saying it as the, it's the only case. If it's a narrow mm -hmm. extra case, it's just added bonus. Even if it's a small mm -hmm. one, it's still bonus. Like, this is more like how much of this scenario are we going to win? But this is just one scenario amongst others. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can try the deck. Sure, yeah. See what Let me see. So, Bucky, oh, Forge, Carnage, Brood, Surfer. I think I've got it. Okay, do you, wanna, do, you play, do you want me to play? Um, either way, I'm, I'm happy to listen as you work through it, or as you I can play it. I, don't, I really don't mind. Okay. Um, I might not mind watching you uh, go through the trade-offs. Uh, let's go Conquest. Let's, let's play it for real. Yeah. All right. So we said, because in the end, like, I mean, we said one of the big limitations of the Forge Brood Absorbing Man combo was space. Destroy yeah. solves that limitation, so who knows? Okay, so it sounds like for now I'm going for the Berkey Barnes Deathlock line rather than the Forge line. Which is fine, because Forge Brood works on five. I mean, everything works on five, but... Mm -hmm. King of Games... What are you playing, King of Games? What do you know? Oh. Oh. What's better to copy, Forge or Bucky? Because Forge is more flexible. Bucky is like calling our opponent to please armor a Cosmo that lane, and then they get a second one. I feel like we don't really have a card right now to immediately pay off the forge if no, we, we copy have, it. We have himself. So we can keep playing it here until we find it. <laughs> oh, that's fair. That's fair. That's why. And I was then we can always just destroy it. that anyway. Yeah. 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 Let's try that. Okay. Because otherwise, there's another reason. Like, Bucky Barnes could just be a play because it's still early in the game, and if my opponent armor or cosmos me, I know it, and I just move on. Hey! We take it, right? Or anyone sees a reason not to take a 15 power brood? We've... I mean, this is our game plan. I think we should try it. Yeah. And we also get a, an excellent 5 where we go Bucky Barnes Deathlock. Oh, we're playing against a real deck from the get-go. <laughs> Let's see how good it is. Oh boy. <laughs> we do this, right? And next turn we do it on... Here? <laughs> is that how it works? I want a snap. I mean, if, I we're trust not, you. if, if we're not gonna snap, forge into brood into exactly what we ask for, when do we snap? That's right. <laughs> we can also keep that open and uh, Silver Surfer it, by the way. I was going to say, the only reason not to snap is we don't have Surfer yet, but... Yeah, but we said it's going to be difficult to discount death. It's not anymore. That's true, that's true. Like, next turn we can just Bucky Borns... Like, we Bucky Borns Sinister Board, death is a zero. And we get a big carnage. Polaris. Okay. I'll live with 21 here. Oh, you want it, Surfer? Wow. Okay, okay. All right, let's think about it. How do we play this? Because we can do a lot of things. So Bucky Barnes Carnage is death to tree. Which is exactly what we wanted. But we could also just go Surfer Middle. 
And we get a second one. Is that good enough? We could also just um, um, forge middle and then deathlock the right, let it copy itself and keep destroying itself. Um, and then the last copy is still surferable. Um, and and death is free. Can I ask, can I, or, I mean, well, could you also do, uh... I have to do something. Yeah, with death, with death, yeah, never mind, go on. Okay, let's, let's try well, this. It's a weird I'm only line, thinking that, let's see it. So the, the thought I was curious is that, what if you did, you know, you could also have done Bucky into Deathlock and, bo and copy both of them, right? Bucky into Bar Sinister, Deathlock into Bar Sinister, and copy both. Yeah, that because they would have gone. Right. But then you lock Bar Sinister. No, it's only two cards. Yeah, because you get three Buckies. No, I mean Bucky into Bar Sinister, Deathlock into Bar Sinister, and they both would have ended up on the other side, and you could surf her into Deathlock. Oh. Well, that was. I thought the idea was to do something like this, isn't it? That's that's yeah. what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. Is that good enough? Works. Wait. Question. If we do like this, how do we lose? Yeah, because death doubles up too, right? I mean, we get to 27 here. What beats 27? You move Nightcrawler, cool story, after that, what? And we actually get the points here, instead of getting the points where we're behind I mean this kind of deck is going to play Magneto which matches our death anyway and our death lock is higher than their silk so yeah well there's Shang-Chi but if they Shang-Chi Sinister Boar I mean heh you're going to get 14 you're going to get 14 where you're behind so yeah if they Shang-Chi the right we lose but they need to blind Shang-Chi All right, let's see it. They play two cards. I don't think three cards is... Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> All right. Ready. Well, if we deft here, we would have won. Hmm. Okay. Maybe right. we should have tried it against the Prince of Games. <laughs> in you better. Okay. We didn't <laughs> believe in the blind Shang Chi. But yeah. the deck was like the deck felt good. Like we had a winnable game against one of the very best decks in the game. That's okay. Like we're here to test. Huh? The result in the end is not that important. It's how good does it feel? Right? They haven't yeah. shown armor or cosmo, so... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and like you pointed out, one of the limitations is we need a certain amount of experience with our deck. Yeah. Um, this is a brand new one. Shadowland. Oh. That's good for us. Yeah. Oh. That's annoying, though. <laughs> Um, if I go Daken, can I go short Venom? That's what I like. And pick up the Wrath too, huh? Is there any other way? And we... Because there's another way, which is just Deathlock now, and next turn we just X-23 Daken. Right. But then we'd need a Killmonger to get that X-23 working for us. Yes. But if we do the Daken line, we give Venom a great shank Yeah, game. that's right. Okay. Because this way, we gain the Raft. Well, at least we compete mm -hmm. for it. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's no shank target. And if we get Killmonger, we get the added bonus. Hey, there you go. Oh, oh okay. look at that. Huh. All right, I'm going to snap again. And now we snap. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say. And it's not even sure they can challenge it. I mean, okay, they have Kitty Pride, but they only have three energies for two cards. 
Yeah, and, and st- I mean, it still could stick, but it didn't stick. Oh, what a great card. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Oh, it's a 10 for 0, I'll take it. Uh, get it to kick out the shard. <laughs> oh, get it to kick yeah. out X-23 so I can Venom. No, okay. Yeah. I mean, so that's part of the fun. They often are going to be trying to disrupt our stacks because they're you know, expecting us to destroy everything, but we actually want to leave a certain amount on the board to later oh, surfer, no. so... Huh. Hmm. The shard, shard carnage on the right, or... No, you cannot. Sorry. You kill Munger. Never mind. Um, uh... Shard carnage isn't why not... so bad. Why not Helicarrier Venom? I mean, then it's because just a... Because Helicarrier is a zero next turn. Yeah. What if we just kill Monger this turn, and then next turn we can shard Venom Surfer plus Helicarrier somewhere? And we, we get the Nightcrawler too, and the and the negative two on their side. So if we draw Death, she should be really cheap. No, oh, okay, I like it. If there's three. Oh, yeah. that's that's five right there, right? One, two, three, four. Oh, four, because we didn't do the shard yet. Yeah, but Deathlock got one already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's five, at least five right there. Yeah, we're looking great. Yeah, and you still have the shard? Oof. Well, wait, is it that bad? Like, what happens if we just do this? Yeah. Oh, this is the final turn, too. Okay. Like, they don't have Zabu or anything. Like, they can't win in the middle with just Shang-Chi. They need Shang-Chi plus something else. Here, we get plus five. So we're at 16. And here, we get 6 and 6, we get plus 12, we're at 18. That feels pretty good, to be honest. Yeah. I'm just going to check the order. This, 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 this. All right. Yeah. Give us back our cubes. <laughs> you might have created something, Silvermint. I'm not going to lie. This is feeling pretty good. Okay, but then I spent 10 minutes saying, I've already been convinced it can't work, so I don't get the credit. It's not about the credit, it's about being a legend. Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, well, you can win left, but you need to win two lanes. Nope. Okay, Silk just, just wants to play Tarzan. Have fun, Silk. What, what can I say? Is this a bot or something? Like, are you gonna do this all the time? You still lose, but... This man sniping's ability is like, wow! That was... Yeah. that was stunning. Well, he was probably hunting really? for death, right? Yeah, but still, like... Way right there, <laughs> like... Ooh, X-23 on one? Do it. Okay. Give me Forge! Uh... Would we rather go blind or would we rather go here? We're gonna destroy it, but I think it's okay to play it here. Yeah. Okay, give me Forge and that's gonna be a hell of a good time. Oh. Oh. Carnage. Do we just Carnage it? I don't mind going Absorbing Man on it. <laughs> huh. I guess we want to Brood. But yeah, but I like Carnage now. Because then it gives us a choice, do we Absorbing Man again, or do we Brood? I like it. I just want to play my cards, like... We already <laughs> said we have a problem with death, so we get a Destroy, I think we take it. Okay. Oh. Oh. I'm, I'm gonna oh. Absorbing Man this! <laughs> Wait, do, do we want to Snap? Yeah. Or is it too early? Yeah. I don't know. You have Brood and Surfer in your hand, too. Alright. And something, and you can play Brood onto the, um, the center, right? Or did you already get the two off that? You have not, so... There's two yeah, more onto the, the Brood. The thing is, the, the Brood isn't gonna be... Like, the Brood itself is gonna be a five, but the Brood links are gonna be summoned before the plus three. Gotcha. So what I want right now is X-23 to go metal, so I can just death lock it and it's an eight, and it's perfect. Good girl! <laughs> okay, so he's gonna shank she us here later on. Oh. Nice. You can't shank she multiple lanes though. Yep. 
No, but that's good, because we know we just have to beat 10. So, like, on the last turn, we can just Brute Surfer and take it back. Why are you playing left so much? Like, what kind of deck is he? Angela? Oh, he's... Oh, we don't play right and he can't win! He can't Shang-Chi anymore! Oh. Silk is blocking! Oh, ho, 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 ho. Oh. Just surf, surfer, yeah, just, yeah, just, just Killmonger. No, not now. No, 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 we no, wouldn't no, leave it blocked. No, 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 on six, you win the lane with Killmonger. Uh, wait, if I Killmonger on six, wait, but I have to play to the right. Because, uh, well, I mean, whatever you play there, you win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not screwed so. middle, I don't know, Bucky left, just make him think we're setting up something there? I'm almost tempted um, to surfer right now, to be honest. Before Brood? No, Brood Surfer. We have six. Oh, wait. Oh, my goodness. Wait. Uh, I lost track of it. I thought we were in five. My god. We sorry. are on turn five, but we destroyed X-23. Wait. Oh, god. okay. Sorry. Turn five. Okay, everybody. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. I think I like you yeah, Brood Surfer? He's a Brood, and the Brood goes where? Uh, we don't know. Oh, no. oh you just lost. Oh, you just lost. Yeah, we, we used it with the yeah, yeah, I like it. Wait, wasn't it the first score? Oh no, it was Deathlock. Okay. How does he win? Oh, hello, Death. How you doing? So... Hmm. We don't. We don't gain anything by. We have priority, so oh. Killmonger does nothing. Yeah. He can't shank she middle. He can't shank she right. He's gonna shank she left maybe, but we're not gonna give it to him. I mean, actually, Killmonger gives us points on the right. Cause it's plus three. We still well, so. Here. We know that he's gonna. They can't change the other way because it's blocked until we move. So there's no way for them to drop the card. So death on the right. Yeah, but death on the right is just lost points. We win it with Killmonger. But what prevents them from Shang Chi on the left? Nothing. But why would I use twelve when I can win it with three? But no, Killmonger does the Killmonger is even with the with the what you have would be for the Silk, right? No, because Silk moves. No, right, right. I, mean, I don't want Silk to move. Because then, no, what's when comes back? Yeah, I trust then you. Then Captain Marvel can come back over there. Yeah, I think it's that way, and we just... That okay. Like, all the stock in just for the gate to leave. Just that. <laughs> okay, so let's, right. let's take a second here. So... Yeah. Because if Silk goes into the middle, he's at 13, and suddenly he can win the middle. But at the same time, he doesn't have Zabu, he doesn't have all this. And he played Spider-Man. So his turn six is what? Shang-Chi here, Kitty Pride? And that beats us, right? Because this mm -hmm. is plus four, so he would be at nine. And his scores would represent zero. But then if Silk moves here, he's only at 13. So we would, move, we would win this and this, wouldn't we? Yeah. You would win. So on the right side, it would be five, oh, but five versus... Captain Marvel can be on the right side because we exactly, can't. Exactly, that's what I was just saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I completely missed that part. Because Captain Marvel would kill the X2 and the 2 1 1, so that's a, null, that's a zero, that's, you know, even. And so Captain Marvel now has room. Yeah. I thought you were talking about Silk, not Captain Marvel. That's completely on me. No, no, because once Silk moved, I was like, okay, Captain Marvel can get in there. Do we just play Carnage so, because we have all our destroys and it's just two points? All right, now I gotta figure out what's next. Oh. Or do we keep it for turn five? Yeah, I guess it's turn five. I think so. Okay. That killing that night crawler is gonna be so juicy. <laughs> oh. Um, I just want to play a seven power or something. Oh wait, I can send silk here. Ha! I'm I'm taking that. I'm sorry. I'm trying it. We gotta. Fifty fifty to kill silk. Sign me up. 
Bye, Silk. No. Do we snap? I mean, we killed Silk. Nightcrawler is better. Is dead whenever we play Killmonger. We get brood. I mean, I'm looking at our. I think we snap. Are you okay with that, Bishop? Have we I seen him play Craven yet? Sorry, I was off screen. Craven? Oh, him? Yeah, I don't think they've. Yeah, they haven't played it yet. No, we haven't seen it. Have they? Interesting. Well, they haven't played Jeff either. Hmm. Oh, wow, that's a big Morales. Okay, so that lane is. Oh, hello. So, what do we do? So, Death is a 6. Death is a 5. We don't have priority. So, Death, if he plays Kitty Pride, we get it. Or. We just do something like this. Nah, it's worse. Nah, I guess it has to be this. All right, anyone has some kind of prayer that they're going to play Kitty Pride? Oh. Yeah, no, that's... No. The hairs look alike, but that's not the same card. <laughs> okay, we lost the right. That's okay. Can we lose left? We we never lose left if we surf for right. Like how do we lose if we do this? It wouldn't it be a benefit to do um surfer before Carnage? Just makes it a little bit taller. Well it's two for two, it doesn't change anything. Is there a difference with like having two on that card or two on that card? Because then, because then Surfer could be destroyed by Carnage as well. If we went Bucky Surfer Carnage. Yeah, but like, how does it change our points? That's my question. The total points are the exact same. We're gonna get six, four, and two instead of six and six. Ah, okay. But Sur Carnage gets plus two when he destroys something. Surfer is a two. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Is he is he trying the mighty Shang Chi in the middle? Zabu. I tried the mighty Shang Chi and he got caught. Okay, so oh. I'm happy. It's not a bot. It's someone that just has a very high belief in Shang Chi. I'm not gonna jinx us, but I really like the look of this game. I'm not gonna lie, I see some upsides. Okay, and Forge? I mean, Forge saves that hand. Forge or Bucky Barnes, any other two costs, please. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, nice. Alright, what do we want? Do we want to get more Bucky Barnes set up for death, or do we want to make sure we win this? What's the downside of doing Bucky Barnes? Oh, you mean li this the uh, left lane? Yeah, um, my question is, do we build on the middle or do we go for the two cards? I kind of want to go for the two cards. They've been able to get pretty tall by turn four. Um, well, we're going to get 11 by turn three. All right, fair. Oh, well, you asked. Oh, about there Craven. it is. Okay. You asked about Craven. There we go. Oh, hello. Oh, oh, okay. Come on. Okay, so, take a breather. Because they yeah. can move there, but we can brood there. Oh, I want to brood there. We get to six next turn. Yep. Or do, wait, wait, wait. Do I want to just Daken? I can just play Dakens here and just play all my Muramasa shorts there. Eh. Oh, it's so complicated. I'm gonna go with Brood this turn. I like that one. We get to keep some points there and... Ah. Was it that bad? 
I don't know. Oh, hello, Death. Don't worry. <laughs> You're getting there this time. Let's see, so... This? This? I like it. Raven again. Taboo. Eh. Oh wait, nobody gets cards. Mm -hmm. Not so bad. That's not so bad. Let's draw a surfer and we're like friends. Absorbing man. Last card I played is Daykin? Uh I believe so. Uh did you see Bishop? Hold on. So wait, what happens if I just do this? I'm back. Okay. I think that's the way, assuming that we play well, Dick. I'm if, I'm pretty if we, sure if we do this we're gonna have priority. Mm. Why not? Oh no, I see. We wouldn't get it in time back. Um. I think we still have to yeah. do it, and then we can decide if we want to play the second shard or not. Yeah. Oh, he's gonna lock metal. Oh, if he locks huh. metal, that's so good. One of them will be a bounce, right? Or a silk, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, didn't she? Why Enchantress? Oh. I see, so half move, half tact, okay. Okay, so. He's gonna Shang-Chi here, he has to. Yeah, so we can actually leave the shard as it is and just surprise him by staying below that limit. Um. But I don't want Silk to go here. We can't add more points to it. But then we can just... Well, if we... Yeah, death in the middle, and then... Well, Silk will move anyway, because they're going to um, probably try to Shang-Chi that lane. Yeah, but if they Shang-Chi and Silk leaves, they lose. Because they only get nine. Is there a benefit to playing a one on the right, just in case... No, we have priority, so we can't control no. where it bounces. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to keep it off the right. I see it. I mean, we lose right, but we assume the card is shang -Chi. Ha! Yeah. Got you. Oh. Uh, not got you. You can move. Yeah. We couldn't beat that. No, well, I don't we think we could. tie it. Nah, if we played Killmonger left, we would have won. We would be tied. And we would have won here with the difference. Ah. Okay. Well, the good I thing still is, like our chances. we we lost two matches. We lost a four and two, and both times we could have won that game. To put it in terms of the lecture, it seems like what this um, destroy surfer has is it fixes the commitment problem of surfer. Um, we can be radically uncommitted until the end. Yes. Okay. Although death has been a little disappointing up until now. Mm hmm. Hey, look at my deck. Sure. Did you send it? Uh, yeah, it's in chat. Which chat? Uh, did it not go into the chat? Hold on. I don't see anything don't... into group coaching. Oh, or are you talking well, about another chat? Not, not, I put in the team coaching one. Sorry. Oh, okay. I need to. I need to check that more. Sorry. Okay, yeah, we're, we're getting to this afterwards. No problem. Okay. I'll save the image. Okay, okay it's saved. Okay. Wait, we Let get a see. copy? We'll take a copy. Or do we just lose our broods? I can't wait to lose priority and demolish that kitty bright. <laughs> it's okay, because we're just going to kill Monger X and make the necessary space. 
Oh wait, we can surfer next turn if we want to. Oh no, we don't need to. We can kill monger to the right, and then we double surfer on turn six because we get a copy of it. Ah, there we go. That sounds nuts. I really like this deck. Maybe I'm sorry, a I... little bit more disruption. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe, I don't know, like a really goofy idea is have armor so the last turn you protect your tall side and they never expect it from a destroy deck. I don't know. Yes. Or actually just a Cosmo um, to protect that lane. Um, and Surfer is your six. Well, yeah, then Cosmo I like it much more. Because the problem with armor is you don't get the buff from Surfer. And yeah. your turn is probably going to be Surfer and uh, armor. Yeah. So it's bad. Yeah. I like Cosmo much, yeah. much more. Yeah, Cosmo and Surfer has some potential. Because, yeah, death is really, like, gimmicky, I feel like. if I feel yeah. like all the games we didn't get help from the locations, she hasn't been there. Yeah. But this turn is going to be nasty. We're going to have eight power, two surfers in hand. Also, if we're not trying to pay off death anymore, then we, you know, some of our earlier destroy targets, like Bucky, we don't necessarily need as much, or we can consider trade-offs. Uh... Yeah, we could consider changing some of it. Oh, damn, Surfer isn't there. My bad. Oh, she came back on the same spot? Oh, come on. Yeah, we're not moving. What's coming? Ah, oh, Silk, you could have gone to the left. That would have been so cool. So we have okay. seven. The last card I played was Carnage. So... If we do, I mean, surfer, bacon surfer. There's not really a ton. We... Why not? Um, oh, brute surfer is better. Brute. I was gonna say brute surfer. Yeah. Yeah, brute surfer is better. My bad. My bad. My bad. And then Marvel's gonna move, which will tip off the Craven. But then we are guaranteed oh, we to plus, win. We get central. Plus, we get plus eight on the right. So yeah. He needs to play. Yeah. That. And the thing is, he needs to play there. Silk needs to come back to it for Marvel to win. That's game. right. So that's a lot of things that need to happen. Okay, so Marvel And we is... haven't given any Shang targets. Marvel is not yeah. doing there. Angela, no. Come on, reveal that Shang Chi. Nightcrawler? Yep. Got him. Oh. Hey, we okay. won. We won our first game against one of the best decks in the game. I'll take it. Thanks for the gold ticket. I lost confidence in that deck way too fast. And one thing you always point out is you've got to test it. You never know until the game tells you. Like, mm -hmm. there are so many things we can't control. You can't have a definitive opinion until you go and check it for yourself. And I got my quest done. Oh, what a night. Oh, okay. okay. Before we get to Bishop's deck, let's discuss that death. Yeah. And then maybe we also discuss Bucky Barnes. But what can we play? Instead of Bucky Barnes, what do we want? Nova? Like back to the Nova idea? So this... It's... uh. <laughs> It helps convince them we're a standard um, surfer deck in a way. Do we need Sarah? But... We haven't even considered Sarah in this deck. Hmm. Hmm. Because I could just like Bucky Barnes and Nova, and we just have good five. Because now we're five is Forge Brood or it's Bucky and a Destroy. I don't know. I guess we have a flex spot. This is our flex. <laughs> Let's sleep on it. Because I'm definitely playing more of this deck. I, I was, I needed to play the Patriot Surfer, or the Patriot, like the deck that won Twitch Rivals yesterday. And now I have another deck. Cool. The end of the week is full of surprises.
I like it. Yeah, we'll we'll think about it, but I, I also definitely want to see what um, Bishop's got cooking for us. All right, and we got a cool name for it. Actually, let's customize it. Which which card bag do you want for a deck? Uh, let's see. What we um, moving on. Yeah, I don't know. This... I mean, the color is pretty great. I'll, I'll go with this. Yeah. Destroy color. Yeah, uh, yeah that works. Uh, okay, so let's check on Bishop's deck. Uh, two. That's it, right? <laughs> no way. All right, tell us a little bit about it. So, um, it was, it was, I was listening to one of the podcasters and they were talking about Jean Grey and Echo together. And I was like, okay, I can, and they were explaining, they were, they basically said, oh, in the destroy category, oh good, my phone's about to die. Um, they said that, you know, they were saying that it was going to destroy package. And I was like, well, I understand, I guess I, I can see how it's great for carnage. So I said, okay, I'm going to try with Echo and Jean Grey because I can see how they package well together. I wanted to see how that went. So I started with that, then I was like, well, I gotta play into Jean Grey, then I need to maximize for Jean Grey, right? So armor to protect the Echo, um, and then if I'm gonna play into Jean Grey, I wanna get out. So then I was looking at, I had something else, and then Stegron I thought was great, because it, it sends, um, for, well, anyways, uh, first was Spider-Ham, because that's also a nice disrupt, and that, plus it gives me information, and then Stegron... I thought it was great because if we both have to play in the Jean Grey and I have to knock them out, then I know I can make them play in there again. And of course, that led to Vision for five because then I can move out. And then, I, then I'm le left with um, a Gamora to win the lane or a Shang-Chi to win the lane or Shadow King package somewhere else. Um, and then that, of course, I went, I was playing, I had somehow gotten Silk in there. And then, of course, when, once I started muck, mucking around with Silk and Jeff, I realized, well, I need Craven too. So, the basic plan is pick a lane that's really bad for them to play in, kind of force them into that lane, and then win the other lane, you know, move out of that lane into other lanes. Okay. But, I mean, I think it makes sense. I'm not really sure about the, the shank sheepless armor, and personally, this deck screams Angela Kitty Pride to me. Because your turn six is likely gonna be a five, and so Kitty Pride just is the perfect complement, and Kitty Pride works with Jean Grey. Okay. So I think like out of the blue, I would change Craven Shang Chi, and have Kitty Pride Angela, because Angela has a similar synergy with Jeff and Silk compared to Craven, and you get the Kitty Pride in for like Gamora Vision on turn six. That kind of stuff. Uh, so drop, drop, drop Shang and uh, Shang Chi and drop. Well, uh, because the idea is you're not trying to play with limitations; you're trying to impose correct. limitation on your opponent. Correct. And the move package allows you to not suffer the limitations when you're trying to enforce it onto your opponent. So mm -hmm. I feel like Kitty Pride works in that way because Kitty Pride is really good with Jin Gray to that. I pay one mana and I can play whatever I want and that can do that every turn. Okay. And the move deck has shown that Craven and Angela are pretty similar with Jeff and Silk. There might be a case with Stegron and Vision, but considering you're not playing Polaris, Spider-Man, that kind of cards, I'm not really sure. I, I had Spider-Man in the league more, but I didn't like... I thought I liked the way that Stegron kind of was more imposing onto the Jean Grey lane or anywhere else I put her. I don't, I don't mind Stegron, it's just, like, what, what I was saying is Craven doesn't have as much support as in the move deck, and yeah, I mean, probably that Stegron could be Captain Marvel, which would probably be better with Craven. and, okay. and then you would remove Shang-Chi and either Spider-Ham or Armor to get Angela and Kitty Pride, and you would keep Craven. Yeah. And then it would be like yeah, a, mod yeah. a modified, like that's a modified move. Uh, yeah, the reason I like the, the reason I like Stogon is when Stogon goes into the Jean Grey lane, 
I go up, they go down, right? So, um, so then I'm more flexible and they're less flexible then because they have to play back into Jean Grey again. Um, and then I just have to deal with whatever Stingron moved out of the way. And that was the thing, if Craven was there, if Craven was somewhere, then Craven, if I knocked out something that was decent size, Craven picked up two points, there's a chance I would pick it up on Craven. I like um, it. I like it. I, just I, had it kind of... I get the idea. He doesn't get big. He gets four, he's a six, maybe, kind of thing. That's good enough. Not a... And, yeah, but then exactly. if you're keeping um, Craven, how often is Shadow King gonna be annoying to yourself? Just on the Craven lane? Um, well, usually, usually Shadow King may end up back into the Jean Grey line, which generally isn't that big to begin with. Um, then maybe that's so. What I would do? Cut. Yeah. So what I would do is like, if I like, I like Shadow King lines. Like sometimes we're, I'm chasing down a Carnage or something like that, right? Or um. I would sometimes play the Jean Grey into the Shuri lane, into the Shuri lab lane, and then I could lock down that, or if they play into Shuri and I can get Jean Grey on Shuri, because they're going to go big, right, and then try to cross over, then I can come back with a Shadow King and say, well, um, especially because I've often armored as well to protect the Echo, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, Shadow King, reduce, you know, my cards outnumber your cards, or they're, they're numbered... You know that you no longer can count on destroy that way either. You can't blow up your your uh, Nimrod. I get what you're um, saying. So, so it just found it. It found out to be useful. I mean, again, it's kind of more of a control package, but I'm not. You uh, know, it's uh, not always the most useful. I, I like but. I like the idea. Uh, it's it's more like still trying to do your own thing while not trying to limit the opponent too much. Like for example, is Spider Ham that good with Jean Grey? Because if the opponent intends to only play one card per turn, it has to be on Jean Grey. Like, if you right. stag run them on turn 5, and their play was going to be a 6, you know where it is. So is that really... Do we really need to transform that into a pick? Um, maybe not. I did find whatever the two... I, I thought about Mirage at 1.2, because it gave me another low-cost card that I could then feed back into Jean Grey. But the nice thing about... My normal flow, if it works, would be... Either Craven, or obviously Craven out, or Jeff out, or um, if I got Spider Ham, then I Jean grade into the Spider Ham lane because then I was a two three, right? Then I was I was usually one up, um, or I, I, I try to Jean grade into the Jeff lane. Um, so I mean, it's not impossible. I was, I mean, I just I was trying to think what I've killed with it that have been useful. Taking out Captain Marvels, which can be pretty useful. Um, Magneto. Uh, so I guess it kind of depends on what's in the meta at the time. Um, I think so. uh, no has been good to kill, right? Or um, death, because they usually go early. Okay. So Sierra yeah. is another one that's been I've run into a few times. So I think it it, 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 it limits a lot of the I'm going to go ahead and win this lane anyways kind of stuff. So maybe, I don't know, it seems to be useful so far. I mean, but, I, I, um, I like the deck. I re I really like the I really like the deck. It's more the the fact that you don't really have a turn six. Like it's right. more of a five, and when I, when I see that, I immediately think Kitty Pride. And currently, when you think Kitty Pride, you think Angela. So that's where I was going. And then with. It, it makes sense. I do try to sometimes have a couple of. I guess yeah. I guess I'm usually a four two on six or. A, it's either a five, so it's just the Gamora, and it doesn't really matter because I'm moving Vision all around, right? Yeah. Or and Vision Jeff, or it's two, uh, three, two, or four, two on six. Um, okay, then could to it, kind of drive, yeah. Then mm -hmm. you're, like, I'm if I understand correctly, your goal is to annoy the opponent through the major part of the game, and you just get enough points at the end to win it. Right. Then they're, they're, I can pick off any lane, and they can't pick off. I can pick off two lanes, and they're just kind of stuck trying to compete for one. You know, what I mean, they, it's really hard for them to get to more than one. But then your deck needs to be as reliable as possible to consistently huh? get the disruptive cards. Right. That feels like a job for Chavez. Okay, that makes sense. I haven't tried that, but that does make sense. 
I, I generally include Chavez in anything I build, but I did not try it in this one. So, but but dropping something for Chavez. So maybe even maybe even I don't know, maybe Shadow King for Chavez. I mean, that that would the be best. the two directions I can think of. Like either add more like points. Chavez. Which would create more of a flexible build, but then you get really close to the move Legion deck where you just remove Legion to get armor right. or spider ammo. Or if you really want to stay on that disruptive path, then yeah, Chavez is going to make Jean Grey more reliable. You're going to have Craven, Spider Ham, that kind of cards more often, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the question is for the poll. Um... I guess it's probably either Shang Chi or Shadow King, and I don't know. Hmm. From what you said, it dip like it really depends how much armor is annoying. Like how often is armor blocking Shang Chi or not? Usually, usually armor's not. I, I find that armor tends to not block Shang Chi because armor's on the echo lane anyways, um, and so you know Shang Chi hunts down the Hulk. You know, like, the, you, I'm gonna, you know, the one thing that they might be able to, like, get off lane, like a big thing. But I'd have to think back, and it's been, I mean, I don't, I'm not really, I'd be honest, I'm not very clear. I, but I could definitely play, bo you know, play for a while and decide which one I find more useful. I think Shadow King was mostly in there for Nimrod. I don't know if Nimrod's fallen off a little bit. I haven't run into it as much as I did for the beginning of the season, yeah. or the beginning of the week. I mean... Destroy is very popular, but Shuri Nimrod is annoyed by the insane amount of Cosmo and armor, so... Yeah, so maybe, maybe armor's enough to catch the Nimrod. Because um, armor often... often is, sometimes I'll hold Echo until my turn 4, and it's Jean Grey Echo as my turn 4. Um, depending on kind of... especially if I'm mostly chasing Null. Because then I can tell where Null goes. So, in which case, Echo prevents Null from ending in the armor lane. Because if you do that, then you don't have a Null anymore. Um, yeah, I see what you mean. They always say about how Echo, it's hard to tell what people are doing with it. Because they, they, they end up having to play around it. I do like, I, I caught a Cosmo in the Echo lane the other day, which was really fun. Because they were like, I was like, oh, I'll just shank you. I didn't have armor in it, and they played the Cosmo, and I was like, I don't know what that was for, but I will Gamora into it anyways and win. So, but um, it does keep people occasionally off guard. So, so anyways, it's just been a fun deck. And it's I've gotten a couple of gold tickets with it. I haven't gotten, I haven't tried going for the Infinity ticket yet. Just, but it's gotten a couple golds. Okay, well, I mean, I, I like the idea, like, regarding, like, limitations and stuff like that. Obviously, when you're trying to disrupt, there are so many cards that you can put in your deck that it's hard to decide. So, I would say, like, the most important part is metagame. And then you have to decide, like, do you want something extra flexible? Or do you want something more reliable? Like, that's really the directions I'll, you have to pick. Yeah, I'll try pulling one of the cards. I mean, I'll, and I'll try with the, um, what do you call it? The... Yeah, the, the 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 oh my god, I can't think of her name right now. The nine, the six nine. Um, yeah, I'll give it a shot and see if they, if having everything come up more reliably just works out pretty well. I mean, if it doesn't, yeah, like if I don't have Jean Grey, then it plays like a decent little move deck um, with a couple of tech cards in there. So I'll give it a shot. I like I like the Chavez. I like trying the Chavez in there. All right. So, oh, thank you. Well, on that note, I think this will be the end of the session. But it was really a fun one. Like, uh, uh, I particularly liked it. I had fun when we played. Uh, are there any any closing questions? I'm honestly going to rewatch this one on YouTube because there were so many good lessons packed into this one. Um, I just want to thank you again. No problem. Oh, right. Happy to help. Happy to help. Ready? All right, on this note, we probably have a little bit more to work on this. Like, the Cosmo idea was nice. So, we shall see. Uh, all right, thanks for, uh, thanks Thank for joining me.
see you next week. Uh, I'm not sure what is next week. Next week is Infinity Gauntlet week. So we'll probably do it early in the week if people want to prep the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, or we'll do it after the OTAs. So either like Monday, Tuesday or rather around Friday. Uh, I'm going to cut the YouTube video. Thanks to everyone we managed to get this way. I know these videos are very long. I hope you're getting something out of it. Uh, I'll make sure to, to read the comments. That's something I usually forget to do on uh, on YouTube because I'm not like an editor on the channel. So I have to remember go in there finding the video and everything but if there's an important question feel free to come on the discord even if you're not a premium member you can just tag me in any channel and i will see you all right have a good night everyone see you next time